This episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Marvin. When it comes to performance and lead times, trust is everything. Marvin gets that. Now their Marvin Elevate and Essential collections have significantly lower lead times. You know these windows and doors for their beautiful designs, durable Ultrex fiberglass, on-trend styles and colorways. Well, now you can have them delivered to your project in less time to help keep your timeline intact. Speaking of trust, Marvin shipping complete and delivered, as promised, more than 90% of the time across all products and options. So when you want the right performance, right on time, no Marvin delivers. Two inches thick over the top of the old slab. That's that mud sill. I mean, if that concrete goes above the mud sill, is that is that any issue there or not? You should have brought this up before he did that. Is what I would say. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Technical Editor Mark Peterson. Hello. Fine Home Building Senior Editor Brian Pontalillo. Hey, everyone. And Fine Home Building Senior Editor Jeff Rose. Howdy. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. It's good to see you guys this morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks. It's good to see you. Especially it's, uh, you, Brian. Haven't seen you. Haven't seen you in a while. Yeah. It's yeah we were that another, another podcast with another um, person who's been building their, their own house. <laughs> yep. We just, There's uh, a trend. We just chatting with Ian on the last one and, uh, you know, Ian started, I think, probably around the same time as you, just a little before me. And yeah. we we built very similar houses, so he was a great resource for me. I could send him emails and say, hey, how'd you do this? How'd you do right. that? Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. How long did it take you? And how much of the work? I mean, I, I, you probably rehashed this. I, I didn't hear the last one, but just quickly, how long did it? I mean, the whole process from start to finish. I mean, it's from the time you dug a hole. Yeah. So we uh, excavator rolled on site on April 9th, and we moved in on October 31st. Wow, you got a good memory. <laughs> I was my, well, I'm like blown away. <laughs> well, it, it was the, the reason I remember is um, well, I'm not sure why I remember the, the day the excavator showed up. Maybe because of, maybe because of so much anticipation. Yeah. But um, one time at, at one point towards the end of the summer, Amy said, "When do you think uh, we'll be moving in?" And I said, "Halloween." And sure enough, we got our temporary CO on Halloween. Nice. Uh, yeah. So that was just a lucky guess. <laughs> <laughs> so you defy all of the uh, algorithms that folks have proposed for how long a uh, building project should take. H how do you explain that? Um, partially, um, I, I used, so the, in the year leading up to um, breaking ground, um, I did. I was designing the house and planning, uh, doing a lot of planning. So I did. I did tons of planning. In fact, I mean, there were. I was amazed how little the plans had to come out on the job. I had so much of it in my head. Um, it's also a simple house, uh, but I, I did something that I learned being a journalist, which was that I hounded everyone. <laughs> I hounded all of our subs. I I I told them I was building this house you know, six months or more before we were, before we started, I let them know what I was thinking in terms of, um, in terms of dates and schedule. And I just kept, um, sort of updating that with them just to kind of stay on the radar. And I kid you not, they came in here one after another. I mean, there were times when we didn't miss a day between subs. Wow. You just described so. the exact opposite experience that I had. <laughs> I couldn't help but be thinking that Mark. <laughs> Well, my problem down here was I didn't know anybody, Brian. I just, I didn't, you know, all my connections up, it would have been so much easier because I've worked with so many people up right. in the Twin Cities. I knew zero people down here. And that was the problem for me. That was yeah. one of the, one of the problems for me. Yeah. Yeah. And you had to get, you had to get used to, you know, local stuff. That is a big part of building, right? And, and it was so busy that they weren't about to, you know, piss off their, their bread and butter contractors that they work for to come and work for me. It just wasn't going to happen. Right. And I, it was understandable, but it was frustrating. 
Yeah. Uh, Mark, can you tell Brian what your uh, subs time frame for being back on your job site? Uh, oh, can you explain three that? Weeks. Yeah. Three weeks is the magic rule. So when a sub shows up and says, I'll do it and I'll be out in about three weeks, that's code for I'm not going to show up at all. <laughs> <laughs> and it happened. I bet you it happened a half a dozen times. And on big, on, you know, on, on block work and on framing and on trim carpenters and on electric, almost every sub, if they said three weeks, they weren't going to show up. And, and I, I kind of understand the psychology because, you know, they're super busy right now. They know next week is going to be busy. And in their mind, they don't really look out to that third week and they're thinking, oh, I think, yeah, I think in three weeks I'll be, you know, I'll be free enough to do it. But yeah, I went through three different mason crews, three different framing crews and three different trim carpenters and two electricians. And they, every single one of them used the three week window. So, I mean, if you can imagine you go through three weeks and waiting and they don't show up and you got to go through this process again, I mean, yeah. it's just brutal. Yeah. Well, I did. We we framed our house, and, and there's a the nice aspect of that is that we knew when we were going to start. And I mean, with accepting weather delays, um, sure. again, yeah, I'll say this over and over again: simple house. So, accepting weather delays, we we could pretty um, with with pretty good accuracy, we could predict how long it was going to take. So, I was able once we once we started framing, I was really able to give plumber and electrician and and subsequent subs a timeline. Um, yeah. Also, there's a, you know, there's a, we live in an area where there's a lot of, um, uh, a very, there's a lot of wealth and a lot of complex projects for plumbers and electricians. And, you know, we worked with a couple of companies that have a few crews, you know, they're sizable companies, not just, you know, a single operator in their van, right. but yeah. sizable companies. And, and both the plumber and the electrician said, this was a nice job for us because we, it was, it, it was a simple place with, and we knew the time frame was going to be short. So we knew that we, whatever crew was freed up, we could send over there and we could dedicate that amount of time to knocking your job out. Sure. You know, and that makes a big difference. You know, yeah. They're often on jobs. They're often on complex jobs for, you know, months at a time and then have to go back. And, you know, yeah. and this was not the case. I mean, both plumbing and electrical rough and were done in a week. Yeah. And this that was exact again, exact opposite with mine. My house. It's not it's a complex, but it's two stories, which is not common down here. It's bit, you know, it's nine foot walls, which is not, you know, it's just exact. out And 12, you know, for some reason. Uh, I mean, I love the look, but twelve twelve pitch is just uh, such a pain in the ass. <laughs> so many, in so many, in so many different aspects, and I think a lot of people saw that and just said. And I was bidding my shop and my house, so it was a huge project. I mean, it was, and my shop is still not built yet, but I couldn't get anybody to even think about coming up when it was my. I wanted them to frame the house and the shop at the same time. It just wasn't, you know. They just looked at it and said, oh, "I'm going to be there for a month. I can't do that." Yeah. So here's an here's an interesting story. One last thing I'll, I'll say about my house before we get into the today's show. Um, so we have a very simple roof, right? It, uh, uh, six pitch on one side, three pitch on the other side. So walkable, and um, it doesn't even have a ridge, right? Because it's a clear story roof. Um, so there's there's not even a ridge. There's some flashing to do, obviously, on the upper roof. But we, we should explain that because that's going to confuse people, Brian. So you have what I would describe as like two monoslopes separated by like a little clear story wall it's what yeah. three feet three feet tall i'm guessing it, that's exactly right and that's tall. there's a name for that that's a it's a is it plan is plan is something or other there's a name for that that type of roof line isn't there boy you're nerdy <laughs> yeah i just actually i just came you know what i just came across it not that long ago and it was it was on this podcast uh and I thought I'd never heard of that roof before because somebody asked the question anyway. But yeah, go on. So there's well, no I mean, bridge. If, yeah. if you come back across it, I'd love to know. I've been calling it a clear story roof because if you have clear story windows, um, this this roof, we don't actually have them. It was more of a design feature, a way to break up the roof on, uh, on our house, which is essentially a wide square. And so... Um, but it, if you had clear store windows and, and vaulted ceilings, it, your roof would look like this. Um, but anyway, very simple walkable roof with, you know, only two penetrations, um, you know, the, the radon and plumbing stacks, you know, that so super yeah. simple. So I hired a roofer to do the roof. I, I thought, you know, asphalt roofing, I've done it before. 
easy enough to do, but Amy and I are doing, are, are the builders on this project and that's going to slow us down for weeks, right? Cause it's just two of us without equipment, without a lift to bring shingles up all that. And so even though it, it's pretty straightforward, it would just be time consuming. So I got quotes on roofing and I decided on a company, um, I decided to go with a particular company that does lifetime warranty asphalt, um, roofs and they were supposed to show up. I think it was a Wednesday. They were supposed to show up that morning. And so, uh, but they did not And so I checked in with the, um, the company owner said, you know, are, are you still coming today? And he said, yeah, we're still coming. We'll be there. We'll be there in a little bit. And, and he said, and he was supposed, they were going to finish the job in a day, which I was already surprised at. And then, you know, noon comes, Oh, get a text from, Oh, they got delayed on the job, but don't worry. They're still coming and they'll still get the job done today. And now I'm thinking, Maybe they're not showing up like this. This guy must be full of it. I, I kid you not. Three o'clock comes. I get the final text. They're on their way. They'll still finish the job today. Wow. They showed up a, a, close to four. They finished at seven. Yeah, that's unbelievable. A crew and on it would have taken you and, and it would have taken you how long to do it? Oh, yeah. Weeks. It would have taken us weeks. I mean, yeah. you know, two, two of us and and just be, you know, moving slowly, being safe. They had about three people on each side of the roof and two people on the ground. Yeah. And uh, yeah, four hours. Yeah. And it's nice that because there's really not I mean, as long as you're paying attention to the flashing details, it's kind of hard to screw up. You know, unless, yes. well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, if your nailing patterns are wrong, you're only going through one shingle and that sort of thing. But, you know, these guys have done, well, they're doing three a day. So they have plenty of experience. I had to take They pictures. do more roofing in an hour than I've done in my entire life, right? Mm. Yeah. I had to take pictures <laughs> for the building officials. So I had to watch them and, uh, and they did, they did great. Yeah. What did your just- building uh, official want to see? Nailing. He wanted to see underlayment uh-huh. and, and nailing. Interesting. Yeah. Just to, yeah. so to make sure that they they have enough nails and they're going through two shingles and they're not too high, too low. That's yeah. And we use zip sheeting on the roof, but the, 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 the warranty requires that they use their underlayment. So mm. um, we got that extra, we got extra layer of synthetic underlayment over the, over the zip. Sure. I had a great experience last weekend hanging out with uh, Mike Lombardi, who I described to Carol as a national treasure. He was <laughs> teaching uh, young folks how to do plumbing, and um, I agreed to help out with this small event. I think there was six or seven kids there, and um, you know, I was expecting that we would be like looking at pipe wrenches and you know screwing. Uh, plumbing fittings together and, and maybe, you know, piecing some plastic pipes together. Well, I show up and he has like these vignettes. He's got an electric uh, resistance water heater that he was teaching the kids how to turn off the power and check continuity and check for voltage. And then he taught them how to lay out a, you know, stainless steel sink in a, a laminate countertop and then cut it out. And if you ever want to see the look of sheer joy on a kid's face is give them a jigsaw and let them like start (laughs) cutting into a laminate countertop. Um, And then they mounted a shower valve on a wall mock up. It was, it was incredible. And uh, you know, I would tell anyone who thinks that we need to do something more about getting young people and interested in trade work. This seems like a pretty good way to do it. And it was also, you know, incredibly enjoyable for me and, uh, yeah. Wonderful. I've always found plumbing and new construction plumbing, especially and uh, electrical, strangely satisfying when you can connect these drains or do this and that. And, and you, you turn the faucet on and it comes on the right way and then it drains and there's no <laughs> leaks or you flip a light switch. I don't know. It's really gratifying because there's really a, a there's a bigger payoff on that than a lot of the uh, a lot of the different stuff. Uh, my son just uh, put in his first kitchen sink. They they went to a bigger one basin sink and it was kind of fancy deal. So it was his first, uh, experience <laughs> putting, I don't know how many sinks you've installed kitchen sinks, but those fasteners that hold them to the countertops are, I, I can't even, I just surprised that they're the exact same things that they were 50 years ago, that nobody came up with a better <laughs> solution. He's like, Oh, I can't believe it. Dad. They're, these, they're way up there. You need these yeah. long. It's like, yeah, you're right. It's ridiculous. They got it. It's I mean, ridiculous. 
And if you buy a chink, cheap sink, the uh, the metal like deflects and it doesn't really pull tight. And yeah, it's just a horrible design. Seems like there's an, there seems like, but then the plumbers, you know, they don't want to have it too easy because then nobody, you know, <laughs> the average homeowner could do it. So you know, of course, there was a, a dad at this uh, event, right, with their kid, and he had recently replaced his kitchen uh, faucet. And he was explaining to me that he had to, like, cut the nuts that secure it to the countertop, right? And I was like, you need a basin wrench. He's like, a what? I was like, a <laughs> basin wrench. I, and yeah. I, I went to my – I brought my toolkit with me, and I brought – he's, he's like, his, his face lit up with joy. Yeah. Of, he's like, oh, that's how you do that. Or even that funky wrench that takes the drain uh, – uh, The strainer? Called. The strainer, yeah, the strainer yeah. drain wrench. Those are pretty handy, too. The great thing about uh, having any time with someone who's experienced in trade work is you you often learn the, like, secret weapon to, uh, to do these uh, weird things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, in our generation, too, it's, we learned a lot of these things the hard way where right now my son just looked it up on YouTube. How do I do yeah. this? Well, yeah. 20 years ago... <laughs> it was a lot harder. So the odds of discovering a, a basin, what a basin wrench is today versus 20 years ago is a lot, uh, your chances are much higher. <laughs> you know, I learned a lot of stuff from the uh, sales associates at the home center, right? Because oftentimes they were folks who had uh, left a day-to-day -day plumbing or uh, electrical work. And, and, you know, if you explain your problem to the right person, they'd be like, oh, you need a basin wrench. Uh, yeah. But it's it's not like that anymore. What have you been up to, Jeff? Did you uh, mow your grass yesterday like we uh, talked about? I did. I, and I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> have you gone electric on the mower yet? No. No, I, I've got like an acre of grass, so it would be. Oh. On a cliff. He needs like a, a, a goat. <laughs> <laughs> on a cliff. Oh, so your, your, whole, your, your lot is pretty steeply sloped? There are part, parts of it that are pretty steeply sloped and very uneven and... You know, I wanted I did to a mow story a once, lot of big rocks. and I did a story once on, I was must have been a sponsored thing, on lawnmower safety. And I never, you know, Minnesota doesn't really have any hills. So <laughs> it was interesting, though, that the, one of the most common uh, accidents that hop, happens with push mowers is, I would think, you know, going up a hill or going sideways a hill, it's actually going down a hill. I mean, you would think that you'd want to, um, it was just easier to let the lawnmower go down the hill. Well, what happens is they slip on the grass because they're and they fall backwards and they pull the mower right oh. over the top of them. So it's, <sighs> when so lawnmower stuff that and I thought you know what if you're wearing flip flops or something while you're you know not that a shoe is going to protect you but I could totally see that happening and they said yeah that's one of the most common on hills going pushing it down the hill is the most common accident. I love talking to you, Mark, because it always evolves into like some gory accident. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's only the only things that stick in my memory are the gory stuff. <laughs> I'm gonna write a. Uh, I'm gonna soon write a question into the podcast on how to get rid of lawn. I want to. I want to mow less. Oh, see, I like mowing. I mow, I need... Although I'm mowing two properties, so it's it's literally five hours every. I only do it about. Oh, every Oh, that's 10 bananas! Days, but... You need a bigger mower. You need a like gotta, combine it's my, or it's something. A, I have a. I have a huge mower. And it still takes me five hours. Wow. I think we need to mow <laughs> less like grass. Looking at it. It, you know, <laughs> I open my window right here and I look out and it's, I just, it, it brings me joy, Patrick. <laughs> well, it's a great time that's to reason to enough to, to do me, it. It's like watching TV. If I have a good podcast to listen to yep. and I'm mowing, it's just like watching TV. And, and then I get to look at the lawn afterwards. <laughs> and, and ride around on fun machinery, right? Right. Exactly. This comes from uh, James. He said, uh, <clears throat> Hey, podcast crew, in the ventilation after show, Mark said he always used an HRV in northern climates and ERV in southern climates. Is that a good rule of thumb? I'm definitely in a northern climate in Ontario, Canada, and an HRV or ERV is required by code in all new homes. Builders install mostly HRV units here, but my understanding is that it is done just because the HRV units are cheaper than ERVs, and nobody knows what these things are anyway, so why pay more? My parents thought their ERV... 
HRV was just a weak bathroom exhaust fan and never used it. <laughs> That's hilarious. Maybe I'm totally wrong here, but I thought an ERV would always be better because it keeps the indoor humidity more of the same. Our summers are humid and the winters are dry. So without the moisture transfer that happens with the ERV, I thought an HRV would make your house too humid in the summer and too dry in the winter. Both common complaints from people here, but I'm not sure those complaints are due to HRV since few people use them properly. Maybe a good topic for a pro talk if you can get someone from one of the companies that make one of these things to be on. Um, so uh, HRVs for northern climes, ERVs for southern climes, that was the common uh, logic, uh, I would say, until maybe a few years ago. And then I, I think with the air tightness uh, standards uh, increasing, uh, ERVs became a, a better choice in, in uh, almost all applications, right? From my end, and I'm not, a, I'm not an HVAC guy by any stretch but from my understanding one of the reasons and they didn't use them up in the like really cold climates was that you would get frost build up in the ervs on the super mm -hmm. duper cold days which kind of makes sense because not only is there cold air there's really cold moist air interacting in those in those you know cross chambers or whatever there are and the other thing is it so if you're in a t if you're in a house where let's say you're getting a lot of frost buildup in your on your windows on a cold day, um, an ERV would do, and I don't understand the science behind it, but an ERV would help with that more. Than, I'm sorry, an HRV would help with that more than an ERV. Hmm. So, but yeah, that's as far as exactly. And, and from the little bit of research that I did, it sounds like the new models of the ERVs are not. And the other thing I think people think is, is an ERV is a dehumidifier or a humidifier? It's not, I mean, it's not, that's not what it does. It's not a whole house dehumidifier. That's something totally different. So you can't it just run, like we you, know, you a... just can't run your furnace fan with an ERV and think all of a sudden your house, your, all of your air is gonna be conditioned inside your house. That's not how it works. Right, so an HRV exchanges heat and an ERV exchanges both heat and moisture. Moisture. So, so it does, it's not a dehumidifier, but it does, it helps to maintain the humidity yep. level inside your house. So if you have, if you are, if you're controlling that humidity level or otherwise happy with that humidity, humidity level, it's going to help to maintain that. I, one, one thing I don't know is how efficient that transfer is, you know, like let's say an HRV is, you know, like 85% efficient or something with the heat transfer. I don't know how efficient ERVs are with the, with the energy tra transfer of moisture, but I, I, my understanding is similar to Patrick's that, 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 that conventional wisdom has evolved that ERVs are used more now in colder climates and it's in some of them preheat to keep the core from having frost issues. Right. Um, and that's how they've sort of, that's how they sort of solved that that problem. Yeah. I think we need a fine home building piece on ERV or HRV question mark, right? Like, uh, and talk about when, you know, either. Or I, and if you want to sense. do a, a, a pro podcast, Patrick, I know an engineer, I spoke with an engineer on one of the stories I did for my fireplace, uh, my wood burning stove story. And he was very helpful. Uh, he was at Brown. Is it Brown or Braun? Yeah. Um, from, yeah, and he was, yeah, he was very helpful, so let me know. Uh, it's an interesting topic, and increasingly they're common, so we, you know, we need to keep up with this stuff. This comes from Handy Randy, which is maybe the best business name ever. Uh, Thanks for your podcast, which I discovered after finding your magazine in a regional library. Shutters in South Florida, there are many contractors installing them, though I think the latest trend is to install stronger fixed-in-place windows. I would expect Florida's West Coast cities to also have similar contractors installing storm shutters. The motorized ones that roll down uh, of an ugly box are expensive, but some prefer them. The Key West shutters you mentioned are called Bahama shutters in South Florida. I think there is something in the legal code of Miami-Dade that says you before you sell your home, you have to show it has hurricane shutters. You're nodding, uh, Mark. Is that something you've heard yeah, too? Yeah, and I, interesting. And, and, I admittedly don't know anything about HRVs, but I do know, I, since I worked at Marvin, I do little, know a little bit more about this topic. Yeah, Miami-Dade is the, it has the most stringent window requirements in North America. Well, it kind of County. figures because it like sticks out there into the South Atlantic, right? And uh, Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Not South Atlantic, and but Southern North Atlantic. Atlantic. You know, people, I think, think, and I know I don't know anything about shutters, but as far as impact windows, I think people think that these windows, you know, aren't 
are not going to break when they get hit by a 70 mile an hour two by four and yeah, right. they will break, they will shatter. Yeah. But the idea isn't to protect the window, it's protect to keep the window in place because soon as you get that one opening and that pressure builds up inside your house, you know, your roof, I don't care how many hurricane straps you use, your roof is gone if it's if a yeah. big enough opening and the wind's blowing the right way. So it's more, to, and it protects the inhabitants too, but it's really to maintain the structure, not so much as just, hey, my windows didn't crack. No, they're going to crack, but they're going to stay in place. So, and yeah. It's like and, a, and Marvin uh, an automotive windshield, even, right? It doesn't, it doesn't <clears throat> not break. Yeah, it breaks right. like, uh, controlled and protects and that occupants. that whole windshield is part of the whole safety of a car. I mean, it's yeah. integral with everything that goes on in a car. And most window companies don't even have, and Miami Dade is so strict that Marvin never even had, up until a few years ago, never made a, they didn't have a window that was strong enough. So they ended up buying a company from down there. And I forget the, what the name of it was, but it, they changed it to Coastline. And actually it was an interesting story. It was, a, it was an immigrant from Cuba who, or his dad might've been an immigrant, but it was kind of a bootstrap story where this guy created this pretty successful window company. And hmm. they strictly, I mean, they're strictly for, for Miami-Dade County, and that's you know that's what they did. So, I bet they're inexpensive. I've, always, I've always, if you see videos, these things are just unbelievable. I mean, they're unreal how strong they are. I mean, there's videos of people taking a sledgehammer and trying their hardest to bust through this glass, and they cannot. It's just amazing. That's cool. <clears throat> but one of the other things about that is, and not to sound like a Marvin Bobo, but you know, if you were if you are in that area, it is. You know, aluminum, you know, it's not just a window, but it's the keeping the glass inside the frame, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things vinyl is probably the least, you know, most susceptible to having the whole thing get bashed out of the frame where aluminum or even wood or fiberglass kind of do a little better job of holding that pain in there. A rainy success. If you uh, have greater interest in this, you can uh, check out Google Street View and look at the... Uh, a different kind of storm shutters that are prevalent in, the, in his part of Florida. He says, you might wonder after seeing hurricanes tear into places like South Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina, even New Jersey slash New York, you would think these people would want hurricane shutters for their homes or the same type of strong windows that South Florida has. Yeah, I think that's totally true. You know, I always thought too, and I, I tried to pitch the idea to Marvin, but I'm surprised that they don't, more window company, and one window company actually did, and I don't know how they did with their campaign, but... I'm surprised that they don't advertise for theft protection more often because mm. these things, like I said, they're hard to get through. And I always laughed at, you know, when window door companies, they promote their lock and how secure the lock is. It's like, you know, I can take a rock that's laying right here and throw it through the glass and, and reach in and open it. You know, how what does it matter? You spend three thousand dollars on an extra secure door lock when there's a window right next to it I can bust through. So even on, I mean, doesn't not even second level, just ground level windows, or maybe on the front or wherever side. You'd think that window companies would promote that. I mean, they're more expensive, but way uh, that's that's the yeah, you know, obstacle, right? Right. Uh, Connor writes. I enjoy the recent after show topic of contractor licensing requirements here in Oregon. The state has made getting your contractor's license an affordable, low barrier process for anyone looking to start their own contracting business. You take 16 hours of classes in person and or online and then pass the construction trades exam. A $325 check, a proof of bond, and insurance will get you started. Renewal every two years requires 8 to 16 hours of continuing education depending on your endorsements. The classes and exam focus almost exclusively on best practices and adhering to the various state laws and regulations regarding contracts, lien laws, warranties, etc. Oregon places a lot of emphasis on protecting the customer's wallet and property and helping to ensure the new contractors have the necessary information to run a financially successful business. I've also included a few photos of the A-frame scaffolding I built using Mike Gerton's article. These came in handy during a siding and window replacement job I had recently. Working off of these scaffold frames meant far fewer trips up and down an extension ladder. I'm not sure why I waited so long to build something so useful. As they say, a craftsman in need of a tool has already paid for it. Thanks to the great podcast and the crew, keep me... You and the crew keep me company during my work day, Connor. Well, thanks, Connor. That's very nice. Did you guys see uh, Connor's A-frame scaffold things? Yeah. And that, you know, when we were, when I was a siding guy, we would buy, we would always buy double-sided, you know, du double-sided ladders. So there's steps on either side of the ladder, you know, and for, and that's similar to what he has there. 
But you know, the uh, but wider and more foot. stable. I'm sure you'd agree. Well, and when you plank up a whole wall, you can plank either side and kind of keep running the. Yeah. And here's a pro tip too. It, with the problem when I just and this popped in my head with double sided ladders. If it's a, if you've ever like replaced it, worked on a light bulb or something directly overhead and had one of those little step ladders. Next time you buy one of those little step stool step ladders, think about getting a double sided one because I don't know about you guys. Have you ever like been on a little step stool, spun around a few times, and tried to walk off the end that doesn't have the steps? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I, I think every one of the step by the ladder that I own, that bottom little brace has, you know, looks like a smiley face from people falling, you know, stepping off the wrong end of it. That's so, a that'll that'll trip you up for sure. Yeah. Yes. So double sided step stools, highly recommend them. Um, Doug says, hello, Patrick. You talked about LED strip lighting in episode 583. I used the LED tape to illuminate a narrow linen closet by installing a door operated, a door operated 120 volt switch to a switched receptacle inside the closet, which power the driver, uh, drivers are the, uh, transformers that these LED strip lights used for power. If you're unfamiliar with the terminology, the tape was fastened to the interior wall adjacent to the door casing, door casing, from the floor up to the top, across and down the other side. The tape is hidden from view and illuminates every shelf perfectly. It is a solution to a problem that I am particularly pleased with. What a great idea, Doug! So Have he you wrote done that yours, up, Patrick. No, I haven't, but I'm I'm pretty excited too. I, I I've got bigger fish to fry right now. But <laughs> did you do any LED lighting yourself, Brian, in your house? The strip. Oh, I think we lost. We got no audio, Brian. I was muted. Um, I didn't do you? it myself, so no, I didn't do any. Uh, we have we have some LED fixtures in the house, but I didn't do any of the electrical work. We hired we hired all electrical. Remember, have last you done time, any Patrick? tape, Mark? What's that? Have you done any of the LED tape? Yeah, we talked about it last time. I told you that I watched that video from the, co the company that I bought the things through, and they said, don't use the snap together connectors because oh, yeah, they're right. junk. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you're selling these, and you're basically telling me, you know, they don't said use buy them, the, yeah. the soldering ones. And you know what? Literally two days ago, my mother-in-law just said, oh, yeah, my one of the sections in my underneath cabinet lighting is not working right now, and I know exactly <laughs> what it is. It's one of those crappy <laughs> connectors. But I don't. I don't know. I mean, they're so tiny. Well, you know what they look like. I mean, I don't know that I would trust my shaky hands to try to solder those. Oh, well, that's just it. Yeah. So we're gonna we're working on finding a, a a feature author on this subject because this stuff is all new. This is like years uh, that that these things became wide widely available, and uh, there's I'm but sure a fun. lot. I to love learn. Doing it. it was actually yeah. it was another satisfying electrical job where. It, well, until they don't work, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, putting it together, it was just like a, I don't know, it was just like a it's fun like little lab, lab experiment or something. Um, our first question comes from Ben. Hey, podcast crew. Thank you for all the great work you do on the podcast. I really enjoy listening to you talk about all the real issues that pros and homeowners run into <laughs> and how they deal with them. The witty banner and formative conversations are very entertaining to listen to. I've been an FHB subscriber for about seven years. I've been basically binge listening to your podcast over the past two months as I renovate my new home. It's in Western Massachusetts and built in 1983. It's been modified over the years with varying levels of skill and quality. Without going off the rails and complaining about the poorly done work previously, I wanna ask you all some questions about renovating the area of the structure I plan to build my shop in. The shop space is roughly 25 by 25. It's a slab on grade foundation that is underneath a three season porch with a deck, a deck built around it at a later time. The deck is essentially, a, is, it is essentially a slightly or not at all sloped membrane roof with poorly done flashing around where the deck was secured to the house and porch. Uh, the ceiling is eight feet high at its lowest point. The deck slash ceiling slopes two and a half inches over 15 feet from the porch to the rear of the structure. It overhangs the edge of the shop on the sides and rear by 16 inches. The shop walls are sheathed with a painted plied wood, which uh, T111. 
There are some issues with water pooling in a few spots on the deck or running off the deck and splashing onto the siding, which causes some water to bleed through the T111 and foundation wall. The water fortunately does not get to the floor as I'm putting down an epoxy floor once I finish all the prep work. I plan on putting up gutters around the side of the ports and the deck to mitigate as much bulk water as possible. I don't know what to do about the pooling in the one area. Maybe a le another layer of bitumen membrane down over slightly sloped plywood or XPS. My main pr concern is where the water pulls on the deck and the bad flashing around the porch. I'd like to eventually insulate the space and put in a heat pump. I'd like your thoughts on water mitigation, insulating an air ceiling shop space. Is it worth it to remove the T111, add a WRB like Tyvek and put on T111? Or will that be way too much work and a bunch of dam and sheathing? Anyway, should I just put house wrap over the T111, add vinyl siding or more T111? I was thinking about spray foam in the inside around the edges of the overhangs to help air seal it and then insulate the walls and ceilings once I weren't wiring. Right now, the shop space is quite hot and humid under the black membrane roof with little ventilation, but there's plenty of spiders to keep me company. Do you have any ideas as how I could mitigate any of these issues? It would be greatly appreciated. Thanks again for the effort, uh, g getting legitimate and useful information to folks. I appreciate it a lot. Well, that is very nice to hear, Ben, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna triage Ben's questions. Uh, so. The flashing detail on the deck to building transition is an abomination, right? That's got to be fixed. Uh, right now, it looks like Vicor, which is a roof membrane, and it's falling off. So that needs to be repaired with, I would suggest, uh, you know, the same details one would use for a membrane roof. Uh, rubber would be what most folks up here would, would prefer, or PVC. Um, what about the pooling, fellas? I mean, a little bit of pooling is kind of not that big of a deal, I don't think, unless it's right on a seam. But it should, I mean, so just so I understand, so it looks like, so you see in the photo, you see the, uh, the, the membrane and you see where the membrane goes up to the house, the sliding glass doors. And it looks like there was a, some type of decking over the top of the, you know, over the top of that membrane. I mean, there has to be, right? You can't just walk around and set up table on top of the membrane, right? You should not, no. It, but, you know, who knows? Maybe the space was not used regularly or, you know, they didn't get that far in the construction. You know, uh, it, that seems to be the situation. I mean, I don't know. If it was mine, I, a little bit of pooling, it wouldn't concern me that much as long as it's sitting on top of a membrane. I don't know. I don't, when you're doing these, if you've ever been on top of commercial buildings, I've never seen one that doesn't have a pool water somewhere. I don't think that in it. I don't think that's the biggest problem here. I think that the connection between that flat roof and the house is a problem and where it goes over the sides, you know, some type of collection system. Brian. Yeah, that's, that sounds about right to me. I, it's the one thing I know, well, one of the things that I noticed in the photos is that, um, you know, not only is the connection from the uh, membrane to the, to the walls poor need to be fixed, but I wonder what the intention was there because unless I'm not reading the photo well, it looks like there's this, there's sort of not enough step up to the level of the house for there to be, to there to, for there to have the intention of being decking on top of that. Yeah. It looks yeah. like a deck, but it doesn't look like it was, it, the height almost looks like, like yeah, yeah. It almost looks like they laid wood right on top of the, on top of the membrane. Right. I don't, you wouldn't, I don't know how you'd have like sleepers or anything else below decking there and have, and, and plane out with the house. So I don't know what the intention of that was, of that, of that, was originally. Um, that's a that's a bit confusing. I'm sure there's a way to devise something to put over it, but also protecting those membranes from sun is a good idea if you can do it one way or another, because that's you know one of the things that degrades them the, the most and the fastest, right, is the UV light. Um, there's, this, uh, there's grids I, you can buy that like little rubber pavers, and there's probably other, there's probably a bunch of them that just sit right on top of that. They're designed to sit right on top of that membrane and you just lay them out like a big, you know, Lego Pad. And they they make these things so people can service rooftop uh, mounted equipment, uh, and you know you, you don't want folks pads, yeah. walking on membrane roofs, so they make little right. walkways and you know places to stand outside the air conditioner. Um, you know I don't know if this space is ever going to be you know a deck with a membrane roof, given the fact that the door is so low. You can move up the door, I guess, but then yeah. the deck is going to be higher than the interior. It's kind of a weird scenario. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the T eleven goes, I mean that's if. Yeah, throwing something on over the top of it. There's absolutely no reason to take to get rid of it. Um, 
could just use it as, I mean, that would be the sheathing if you went over it with something you mentioned buying. I did that in my house in Stowe. It had T111 and we put, you know, felt paper and flashing and then uh, cedar shingles on top of that. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it worked great. And uh, and if you do work that, now really would good. be the time to replace those windows in there and then it, when the new windows, just treat it, treat that T11 like it was sh regular sheathing. sheathing. Right. And so the, the nailing fin would go on the outside of the T11. I think the uh, spray foam in the ceiling is probably a good idea. I don't um, know what else you would do there. You, yeah. It's pretty kind of, you know. Um, and then the, yeah, pooling. Yeah. Um, as far as, yeah, the, the, the strangest, not the strangest, probably the biggest challenge is making sure that connection between that flat roof meets the house. Yeah, we got to fix that because we got bulk water issues almost certainly, right? And if it's not now, it's going to be when. And, uh, you know, yeah. in our triage of buildings, we need to deal with bulk, bulk water as a first priority always. So I also noticed in the photo that it looks like you poured a new slab over the existing slab. On the, um, I'm guessing you mean the apron or the entire entire basement floor? No, it looks or like the entire, entire slab. The entire shop area has a new concrete slab on it. So, is there any concerns? So, if he poured it, I don't, you know, let's say he poured it two inches thick over the top of the old slab. That's that mud sill. I mean, if that concrete goes above the mud sill, is that is that any issue there or not? You should have brought this up before he did that, is what I would say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My guess is there's like a little stem wall or something, right, that it's poured up against. Um, um, that, if, uh, if Maybe, right? yeah. If it is, yeah, then that's, that's fine, perfectly fine, but. Yeah, I, I, unless I'm looking at a different photo from you, it, <laughs> looks like, it looks like there is a stem wall. Yeah, and you can kind of see it on the left door uh, in the photo with oh, the. Oh, that's the third, am I looking at? There's an interior photo. The one with the green ladder in it? Oh, that is the same one. Okay, I missed that. Yep, no, that all looks good. Yeah. Yeah, no, that looks great. Boy, it looks like... It's going to be a great shop, eh? That's it's a, a great pretty shop nice, space. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> well, uh, Ben, I hope you'll keep us posted on what you do, and congratulations on your new house. I hope you love it. And uh, boy, I, you know, I, I've bought... And uh, a couple houses that have had pretty mediocre work with uh, past owners, and uh, it's always a surprise, which you'll enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Keep you on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the problem solving of construction is uh, one of the best parts, right? If you get to fix stuff that's not working. Perry writes, uh, hello, podcast. I plan to completely redo my bathroom this fall, but I don't know what I should be doing with the ceiling. For some ridiculous reason, it's popcorn, and I would prefer to tear it out and completely resheet re rock it. The problem is that I've blown in cellulose above it, so I'm afraid of it all coming down on me. Uh, with scraping the popcorn off, attaching another layer of sheetrock over it with a vapor barrier sandwiched in between be a good solution. The insulation above was previously fiberglass bats with a very inconsistent vapor retarder. Thanks, Perry. What do you guys think? Uh, Perry's in Duluth, which is what, zone seven, six? six. Cold. Yeah. Cold, cold, cold. Yeah. Actually, Another? Duluth is kind of a weird city in Minnesota because it's always 10 degrees colder in the, because, it, you know, it's right on Superior. And so it's always 10 degrees colder in the summer and 10 degrees warmer in the winter. So it's, well, it's, yeah. Because Lake Superior is ginormous. Uh, it's ginormous. It, ginormous. Ten yeah. percent of all. I think I've read ten percent of all the world's fresh water, or some ridiculous number like that. It's insanely deep compared to the rest of the uh, Great yeah. Lakes, too. It's Anywho, a, um, uh, scraping off popcorn ceiling. So uh, have either you, Jeff, uh, any of you guys done this? Jeff shaking yeah. his head. Brian mm -hmm. says, "Yeah." What'd you do, Brian? I I, <laughs> I did. I manually scraped off a few popcorn ceilings, which is messy and um, and no fun. And um, I don't know why uh, he would scrape it off if he was going to put up, uh, you know, you could put up a layer of quarter and sheetrock, right? Right over it. Why scrape it off? It depends, though. I mean, for a small area like that, it's really not. If, if it hasn't, if it's been painted, that's a totally different animal. If it's never been painted using wet, I mean, it using a wet a wet towel or a wet rag it kind of wipes right off or <laughs> or a uh, you know one of those uh, in such a small area one of the steamers that you would take wallpaper off 
it really, it wipes right off if it hasn't been painted. If it's been painted, that's a totally different story. Yeah, and then that's I, elbow. I, that's I did elbow not grease. know that, but I also was just assuming that it had been, that it had paint on it. So I've um, heard uh, if it's not painted, uh, a garden sprayer or a hand sprayer, uh, just wet it down and get a big taping knife and scrape it all off. It does come off really easy. I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. And as Mark suggests, if it's painted, that's a whole different animal. Um, I think it's a good opportunity to go and buy one of these uh, Festool uh, drywall <laughs> sanders $3, with a dust collecting vac yes. and uh, so enjoy using that. You couldn't you get a wide knife and just coat, put a skim coat over the whole thing? It's such a small yeah. area. Yeah. yeah. You know, or even start with the rolling, you know, they have the rolling paint rollers where you put on a mud, just do that first and then skim coat, especially if you're going to put a texture on oatmeal, you know, if you're going to put a knockdown or something over, it doesn't have to be perfect. My guess is Perry wants us to move the ceiling. Otherwise he yeah. would just leave this in place. Right. Um, uh, and I, I don't know about a quarter inch on the ceiling. I've never tried that. Uh, I think that might be hard to do physically with it being so floppy. But um, another, you know, normal layer of dry. Have you tried that? Not quarter, three eighths. Yeah. Think, three eighths. Yeah. Um, but I think you need to experiment, Perry, by wetting this and seeing how hard it is to get off. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you get a, some kind of sander with a dust collecting vac, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put another layer on. I would skim coat what was there. And uh, if you find it's impossible, you often want to put up a new layer of drywall as part of your bathroom model. I think that would be a good solution too. And Final the word, vapor, Jeff, as far what would as the you vapor do? barrier is the vapor barrier goes. What about that? It's paint. Yeah, we so don't latex. we don't need a vapor I mean, that's an barrier. Effect, a, a yeah. good, two good thick coats of latex is a decent vapor barrier, isn't it? Well, you it's know, a vapor. It's a vapor retarder. Right. Um, if if the codes, I mean, and, and if the building requires, you know, a true vapor barrier, then he needs, then he needs the poly. But that kind of also depends on what's going on in the rest of the house. On the rest of the house, yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. there's if 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 it's not in, you know, I don't know. That that's I, I wouldn't be concerned about retrofitting any kind of vapor control in that bathroom. Um, I agree. The drywall is the vapor control. And I don't like, I'm not good at taping. So I would just put up a new sheet of drywall, tape as little as possible and be done with it. Yeah. Jeff, what are you going to do? I'm with Brian. New sheet of drywall. Just rehang the whole ceiling? Yeah. Right over. Normal, new don't normal it, thickness? Yeah, would you get this? Yeah, 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 three, um, half inch drywall. And I might not be saying that if this was the whole house, but I'm assuming this is a small space. Yeah. 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 Well, especially, especially the the ceilings in any kind of rough shape. Keeping the uh, the only well, because well, you just retape the corners, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we haven't talked about the uh, podcast after show. We're going to talk about the hidden costs of construction, which is going to be an interesting topic. Uh, it'll be fresh in the minds of our uh, <laughs> editors, right? Uh, so that'll be fun, and I hope you stay tuned for that. And if you're not an All Access member, I hope you'll consider it. Um, so back to the show. Caleb Carpenter of Rad Woodworks. Caleb was interviewed on uh, Pro Talk a few months ago. Uh, he says, morning, Patrick and podcast crew. I wanted to reach out and say hi. It's been a while. The last time I was on Pro Talk, we talked about my wife's and my search for a new home, or more importantly, a workshop with living quarters. <laughs> it looks like I finally found a home, and we're very excited by it. No means exactly what we wanted, but the price was right, and we think we it will be a good first home for us and a potential future income property when we build our forever home. The house is a modular ranch with a full basement and an oversized two-car garage. After years of listening to the podcast and re-listening, I thought I knew for sure how I would attack a home when I bought one, but I didn't expect to be buying a home built in the last 10 years. I'd love to throw a question at the podcast of where should I start? I'm seriously considering getting an energy audit before we even move in to see if we may be a good candidate for aero barrier. I'd love to talk more about all of your thoughts on modular homes, positives, negatives, and what we could do to make it an energy efficient, healthy home for us. As always, I love the podcast and always listen at least one time through as soon as it comes out. Many thanks, Caleb Carpenter, Rad Woodworks. Well, thanks, Caleb. I'm glad you're uh, able to find a house. That's awesome. No small thing in this uh, crazy real estate market. What do you guys think? Uh, you bought a house that was built in the last 10 years. What are you going to do first? Well, I, I, I do love the idea. I mean, there, there, are some, there are some 
things that you can do, right? That you can sort of observe and maybe know to, you know, prioritize your work, like get up in the attic if the house has an attic and just see if there's air sealing to do stuff like that. There's some, there's some sort of low hanging fruit that can become really obvious. They're just, you know, just an inspection, but I bulk love the water. Idea. Yeah. Well, bulk water, definitely any water issues are always, like you said in the earlier question, Patrick, always the first thing. It's not worth doing anything else until that's taken care of, or you're going to end up finding yourself going back and doing that work over. Um, so bulk water, of course, um, and then sort of some some no-brainers when it comes to performance. But I, I think energy audits are great because they can help you really prioritize. It's going to cost a little money to have a good one done. You know, you need a good energy auditor and a good raider who's going to come in with diagnostic equipment and take a really good look at your place. But um, then they can really help you prioritize your time and your money, you know, so that you're really like, you know, I mean, I might have said this on the podcast before, but, you know, you talk to if you go to a specific trade, you're, they're going to tell you that you need to do what they do first. <laughs> you know, yeah, window of course. Person and you're going to get new windows. Call yeah. a, you know, call an insulator, you're going to get more insulation, you know, yeah. but call an energy auditor that doesn't do that, uh, any of that other work. And you're going to get. The, you know, a, a legitimate um, assessment of your house and a legitimate list of priorities. And usually, or very often anyway, the top priorities are not the expensive stuff. They're not new windows. Yeah. I'm whether gonna, just, whether, I mean, if we're just talking efficient, uh, I mean, starting with the windows and the weather, but, you know, an energy audit is going to find those things. You know, maybe your door was installed at a wonk angle and the weather stripping isn't doing anything. You know, the windows aren't locking tight or, you know, sealing properly or, you know, there is a lot of things that enter. So how would you find a good – where is Caleb, by the way? Can I Patrick, say something you know? first? Uh, because yeah. I, I, I want to reinforce the point. So combustion safety is what – one of the things you really want to make sure is working correctly. And uh, your rater may or may not do that work, but that is something I would totally – uh, want done before I moved into a house because so especially a house of this. Um, so uh, are, are gas appliances being vented correctly? Are they backdrafting? Um, uh, are, are the flues run correctly? And these are things that can kill you and don't have any symptoms uh, to right. most folks. So I would definitely put that atop my list before you go into other parts of the house. Sure. Uh, Even go gas, ahead, Mark. I mean, if you have a gas dryer, I mean, gas dryer, yeah, exhaust, all of these things, things like need to be safe. So go ahead, Mark. What were you? So where was uh, Caleb? So where is Caleb? He's in, uh, 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 in New York. I believe it was upstate, but uh, uh, I forget exactly where. I, I think he's so, Albany, Schenectady area. OK, so Thanks, Brian, Jeff. how would you recommend somebody find a legit auditor? I mean, it, it's kind of like, how do you find a contractor? It's not. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a big um, question, so, but. Yeah. So first of all, the free stuff tends to be of limited usefulness, right? Like if your local utilities or whatever do free energy audits, often they're not very thorough and not that you shouldn't take them up on it because it's free and maybe they're going to give you a box full of, of new light bulbs or something. And, you know, so there's, there, there's definitely benefit there, but um, I would look for someone with some certifications, maybe someone from, you know, who has, you know, building performance Institute certification or something along those lines. Um, ResNet and, is the other one. Yeah. ResNet. And, and if not, at least they have had a, a career some time in a career at, at doing this stuff. Um, you know, maybe they're a longtime builder who has transitioned into doing that work so they know houses. Uh, but a, a lot of people are a lot in that world, as a, unlike, you know, maybe builders and contractors and carpenters and some other trades. But in that world, a lot of people are getting the certifications. They're, this is all new. A lot of it's very new stuff to people. So they're doing the trainings and getting the certifications. So that's where I'd start. So when you said free ones, what do you mean free ones? Well, a lot so of like, many ut utilities will offer like yeah. uh, uh, an energy audit as part of a fee that ratepayers pay on, on every bill. Um, mm. Vermont and Connecticut both have programs like that, and it's meant to uh, improve energy efficiency. And so they have uh, a vested they have a vested interest in it. So wouldn't those be pretty thorough, or not necessarily? It's a mixed bag, I think, is what Brian would say, right? It's it, it can be, but not always. Yeah, I mean, an energy audit is going to, you know, they're going to do um, some thermal imaging. They're going to do a blower door test. If you have a duct system, they're going to do a duct leakage test. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there are quantifiable things that they measure in your house. Um, and then they're going to do a lot of visual inspections, too. If you don't, you know, I talk about going up in your attic and seeing it 
you know, basic air sealing needs to be done. But for, you know, a lot of people might not know what to look for. And so they're going to do those things as well. Um, and then, and even they can even sort of, you know, start to pinpoint things with these, you know, with these tools. And often they will even um, identify um, problems with sort of the health and durability of the house, right? They might, you know, with thermal imaging, they often find water leaks, you know, if they're and, uh, thermal or electrical. I, yeah. Or yeah. you can find electrical problems too with the thermal yeah. imaging. So sometimes that kind of, it's not always just energy performance. It, it can also be other, other problems that are revealed through a, a solid energy audit. I was going to say on the uh, topic of modular homes, modular homes have uh, specific problems where modules meet, uh, described as marriage walls, and they are notorious for air leaks where the modules come together. Um, oftentimes, you'll need to go up in the attic and uh, air seal where those spaces are, and you should also do it in the basement because the, you know, entirety of the house oftentimes had these gaps and uh, they can leak a ton of energy out these holes. So um, how would you define a modular home or how would you that? define a modular home? I mean, a manufactured home is like a mobile home, right? Or it comes out in two big halves and they put it together on a, I mean, as a modular home, how, how would you define a modular home? Both you guys. So, um, you know, as I'm familiar with it, and the model varies a little bit, modules are roadworthy uh, parts of a house that are put together on site with a crane oftentimes. They can be two, three stories. They can be one story. This uh, Caleb's house is a ranch. Um, so I'm guessing, you know, there's a, a at least one or two marriage walls, you know, a, along the length of this structure, right? And, so are they uh, coming out? Are they coming out with insulation and wiring in the walls, or is that just oh, yeah. manufacturing? Yeah, plumbing. So uh, even modular homes are coming out with everything in the walls. Yeah, and then they're usually sided on site. Um, sometimes their uh, uh, ridges are uh, completed, and the uh, modules are shingled, and they have windows in. You know, it's it's uh, it's um, not all that uncommon around here, right, Brian? Jeff, we see them on the roadways. Yeah. 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 Um, there's one I saw, I watched one get built in, in, uh, the town that I live in a, a few years back. And it was fascinating. They brought these, uh, they brought all these individual modules in and just stacked them on site over the course of like, um, maybe two weeks. And then crane operator came and, and kind of put this, you know, kind of put this house together with modules. And in this case it was, um, yeah, there was, there was, uh, there were these modules that were sheathed with uh, zip sheathing and had the roofs on them and had the windows in the walls. But not, so not, insulation, know, not insulation, not insulation or drugs. I don't know what the finish was on the inside. I didn't have a connection there to go over and, and uh, poke, my, <laughs> poke my nose in, unfortunately. I um, mean, I never drove by when anyone was around uh, to do so. But um, I, I, so I don't know what the inside finishes were. Um, but that's the level of, of exterior finish on these. I think it happens in, in a lot of different ways in terms of how complete they come to the site. Sure. Caleb, I... Uh... I hope you love your new house and uh, an oversized two-car garage. I think you're saying all the right things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I hope you all stay tuned for the uh, members all-access after show, and we're going to talk about the hidden cost of construction, which should be a fun conversation. Do you guys have any parting words? No, it was fun. Enjoyed it. It was fun. Um, if y'all have any thoughts on popcorn ceilings or any other subject, I hope you write into the podcast email box. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Mark, Brian, and Jeff for joining me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep Craft Live. Happy building. Thank you very much for listening.